So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this uh, ICCG webinar. My name is Elisa Cagliari. I'm a researcher at FIM ICCG, and I have the pleasure to moderate this uh, ICCG webinar series focusing on disaster risk reduction, which, as you may know, is the hot topic for the center uh, this year. And it's really a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker for today, uh, Dr. Rainer Mechler, who is the Deputy Director of the Risk and Resilience uh, Research Program at the International Institute for Applied System Analysis in Austria, and who will discuss today the contribution that a climate risk analysis perspective uh, can give to the identification of a risk and policy space for loss and damage associated with climate change uh, impacts. As you may know, uh, loss and damage has been one of the most contentious issues to be treated in climate change negotiations in recent years, and mostly because it has been historically associated with the calls for compensation by developing countries and smaller states in particular, uh, compensation for the negative impacts uh, these countries are suffering um, as a result the, of the increased uh, um, frequency and severity of uh, both extreme and low set events, so from the impacts of these kind of events. And mainly because of these political frictions, we still don't have an official definition on, on loss and damage at the UNFCCC level. There are many different perspectives and probably very little consensus on what uh, loss and damage is and how it should be tackled. So in a way, I'm, I'm really happy to have Reinhardt here because uh, he's proposing a framework that somehow allows to uh, disentangle and possibly reconcile these different uh, perspective and this still characterize the loss and damage debate. So about our speaker, very briefly, because I know that Reinhardt is a well-known scientist and many of you probably already know him. But uh, let me just remind that he has more than 15, me, uh, 15 years of experience working on socio-economic aspects related to disaster risk reduction, resilience, and climate change. Uh, besides the, his role at IASA, which uh, I have already mentioned, he has been a visiting professor at the University of Graz, as well as a senior lecturer at the University for Economics and Business in Vienna. He has been leading and contributed to many international research and consultancy projects, and he has been a lead author for the IPCC special report on adaptation to extreme events, uh, so this REX report, and uh, on IPCC fifth assessment report in working group uh, two. And last but not least, he recently founded the Delos and Damage Network, which is meant to be a, a transdisciplinary network of scientists and practitioners informing the loss and damage debate. And one of the major outcomes of uh, the network is the um, book Loss and Damage from Climate Change Concepts, Principles, and Policy Option, which will be launched at COP23. Now, before leaving the floor to you, Reinhard, uh, let me remind our attendees the rules of the games. So, Reinhard, you have 30 minutes for your presentation. This will be followed by a, a question and answer session of 20 minutes, where our audience will be the protagonist. So, all the attendees are invited to um, type their question in the, in the window, let's say, of the system you can see on the right hand side of the screen. And with this, I leave the floor to you, Reinhard, and I thank you again uh, for being with us today. Great. Uh, thanks, Elisa, for the kind words and the introduction. And it's a pleasure to present in this ICCG webinar today on the issue of loss and damage and the risk beyond adaptation. And before starting, um, let me only say one word, one or two words, why I'm engaged in this kind of research, but also policy relevant work. So as Elisa alluded to, so the discussion on loss and damage on the risk beyond adaptation is highly contested, so it's not so clear where it's going. And I think, so for researchers, that's great. So that's a nice field of research, and that's exciting and good. Um, the second aspect is also that I and the other partners in that loss and damage network that Elisa mentioned, where also Elisa is a partner, I should say, um, that we all share this belief that something needs to happen, so that there's need for tackling those risks, those climate-related risks that go beyond adaptation. So it's also this intrinsic motivation to think about something that should be done. What that something is is currently not so clear. 
Um, okay, so that's to start off, and let me try to motivate a little bit as I go along. What, why, why to take action? What to take action on? How that could go forward? So I wanted to talk a little bit about, yeah, present some background, then present some methodological issues um, that we have been working on, a methodological framework that we developed, applications, and some conclusions. Let me just start with a few illustrative slides. We, of course, we all know about COP21. It's now two years, been two years. Great excitement and also a great achievement, to be honest. Uh, the global community came together to create that Paris Agreement that has this high, this 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 massive ambition of going to 1.5 degrees of warming or two degrees maximum. So that's great. That's a great ambition. As we all know. That ambition will be hard to match because we have already like one one degree of warming, and we will go to higher levels of warming very likely. Um, time is also running out, so how to how to really live up to that ambition is a big question. And I should say, what's the reason for um, living up to that ambition? Um, and I want to motivate that also very shortly here because I think sometimes forgotten. The reason is, of course, to avoid dangerous interference with the climate system, as it has been stipulated in Article 2 of the UNFCCC, the Climate Convention in 1992. And that has been, IPCC has taken that forward to operationalize this question, what's dangerous interference with the climate system, and came up with the IPCC, IPCC's reasons for concern. They chart out for five risk areas, how climate change will lead to amplification of certain risks within those areas. And you see what would happen with 1.5, the last one here, 1.5 and 2 degrees of warming. And what comes up is, of course, we are approaching certain danger levels, high danger levels, and action needs to be taken. That's a global picture, and that's the reason for global and collective action on, on climate change. And that's, of course, has been quite important, of course, behind the Paris Agreement. What's sometimes forgotten is that there's quite a few places, regions, communities, countries globally that are already facing dangerous climate change related risks that is eroding people's livelihoods and um, pushing them to the brink. So the small island states are affected by, by sea level rise, the regions in Africa and Asia where drought is having severe impacts. And then of course glacial melt is leading to glacial lake outbursts and things like that as we see here in that lower picture in Peru. Or here we see that lake in Peru. So we have places in the world that are already in certain levels of, are within certain levels of danger. So what to do here? And here also, like we see also some photos from Paris. So here's also a question about responsibility and justice. Uh, what to do about those places that are affected by climate variability, but climate change also. And um, what can be done here? Um, so that's important. That's this, this um, yeah, this view on locally relevant risks of affecting communities and populations in many places in the world has led to a debate on, that led to the, finally, to the loss and damage mechanism in 2013 in Warsaw, where the Warsaw mechanism on loss and damage was created. The debate is much older. The debate started already in 1991, started by, was started by the Alliance of Small Island States, um, actually during the, during the um, writing of the UN Convention on Climate Change. Already then, those small island states were suggesting something needs to be done for those places most vulnerable to climate change. It took more than 20 years to have it happen within that quite vaguely formulated loss and damage mechanism. And then in 2015, in Paris, a standalone article came in additionally to the agreement. That's Article 8, which stipulated that loss and damage is to be dealt with. So some people, including myself, would argue, okay, here we have this third pillar of deliberations under the UNFCCC. But uh, the thing about this is, however, it's rather unclear what it is to deal with, apart from this issue of dangerous climate change, local level, local populations being affected by climate change. So it's rather unclear what policy action, what policy direction, what direction policy is to take. Also, the, as Elisa alluded to, the terrain is extremely contested. The small, small island states are demanding compensation for impacts that they have seen already. Then OCD, the 
uh, Annex 1 countries are suggesting that we need to look forward and support countries, places, populations uh, uh, with their risk management actions for dealing with future risks. Uh, so here, particularly, action has been taken and has been pledged around climate insurance, as many of you will know. So extremely contested um, There is um, an executive committee that meets twice, twice or three times a year to discuss actions, but currently it's rather unclear where the debate is supposed to go to. That's also the reason behind um, our loss and damage that we founded two years back and where we are we'll be having our first publication a book out for COP23. It's unclear where it's going, but loss and damage is located within the architecture, the climate change architecture, as you can see here. So it's sitting under the adaptation committee, well, it's sitting next to the adaptation committee and uh, next to the technology mechanism. So it's somewhat within that architecture. Actions, policy actions happen, debate happens, deliberation happens. Um, around many things, as you can see in that slide. Here we have the work plan, the initial two-year work plan after the loss and damage mechanism was created, um, led to also like installation of an executive committee composed of, um, of developing countries and developed country negotiators, and they created that two-year work plan. As you can see here in that easy chart, there's many action areas that um, should, see, should see attention it is about comprehensive risk management, it's about resilience, slow onset events, it's about financial instruments, it's about migration, displacement. So there's a long list of actions in action areas. And the question is, of course, okay, what, what's emerging here? What's coming out? Can this be aligned? Can, can there any path be taken forward across these action areas? And any, con any concrete issues be taken forward? And now, of course, I mentioned some concrete issues that are on the table already which are heavily contested, however. Um, so there's many action areas, there's also many perspectives on loss and damage. Here, a little uh, figure that actually was just published in Nature Climate Change by colleagues Emily Boyd, Richard James, Richard Jones, and other colleagues that builds on like a survey they have done with experts, negotiators, researchers, practitioners that are engaging in the debate and here they identify four perspectives on what loss and damage is. Um, and as you can see a little bit uh, indicated by this arrow, it's from the past to the future. So the arrow is pointing forward. I think there's somewhat maybe of a little consensus emerging. And the, in the bottom you see the perspective which indicates loss and damage is nothing special. It's just adaptation and mitigation. It's just the same thing. It doesn't need specific actions. The other three perspectives um, identify loss and damage as somewhat being distinct from adaptation mitigation. So the second to last says it's about risk management actions that loss and damage should particularly focus on. The next to last from top would say it's about the limits adaptation. So how can we identify limits? How can we shift those soft and hard limits adaptation? Number three is then the most pronounced. It says, well, loss and damage is about the existential, it's about existential risks that are putting countries and communities to the brink. Actions need to be taken to deal with past impacts, but also um, future issues to be avoided. So we have quite a few perspectives on it, and um, somewhat is no clear consensus yet, but what I try to work out in this publication is that the three uppermost definitions somewhat can be aligned the alignment would be around a risk governance or risk analytical lens. Let me work that out in a second, but before that, um, let me shortly only think about some safe ground to retreat on, like certain definitions that have been taken forward and are somewhat accepted. The definitions on what is it actually, what's loss and damage. Loss and damage is quite vague, but there is some there's some consensus, I think, somewhat about the avoided, the unavoided, and the unavoidable elements of those. Um, so the avoided part of the losses and damages would be would be dealing with um, what can be avoided about risks. And of course, that's well within risk management to think about what actions to take to avoid future risks from becoming pronounced. Unavoided is the other part of the risk management lens on the narrow risk management lens on that. Of course, we know risks are not reduced to zero. 
it's, it's not happening for many reasons, for trade-offs, for cost issues, for acceptability issues. Risks nowhere are reduced to zero. Um, then there's also the unavoidable element. The unavoidable element particularly focuses on the climate issue. So with higher levels of warming, some unavoidable damage and losses loss may occur. For example, small islands going under or um, glaciers disappearing. And of course also people, communities losing their homestead, things like that. Um, so the question is basically, um, if we go back to the four perspectives and the three uppermost of those are presented in the last slide, can we align those? Can we think about dealing with unavoided risks today and avoiding future risks in the future while preventing unavoidable risks? Is there any alignment possible? And again, <clears throat> this all of this loss and damage debate is this leading to some distinct policy action that's, that's different from climate adaptation, but also disaster risk management. My short answer would be yes, there is a certain policy space that shows loss and damage. The loss and damage debate has a distinct um, issue that it should deal with and should, uh, distinct actions should be taken. Yeah, it's this question about the risks and option space. It's also somewhat coming out here again. Here's this void at all publication, Nature of Climate Change, of this week. Here in the middle, you see the risk management here risk management space, so these are practitioners, researchers, etc. So that's the risk management domain of action that is somewhat linked to adaptation mitigation, but that's also interfering with limits to adaptation and also somewhat pointing to the existential area. So these are the four elements and somewhat the suggestion is, well, these, four, these are the four elements and perspectives and the suggestion is risk management can be somewhat as a, like a boundary domain of analysis and action. And that's also pretty much the gist of my further discussion. Before going into that, I should say also somewhat that's somewhat vaguely recognized uh, within the executive committee on loss and damage. Uh, so this expert committee composed of some negotiators, you have some, yeah, some mentioned in the bottom. Um, and so this committee just has just set up a technical expert group that should be composed of negotiators and of experts, researchers, practitioners. And it exactly is supposed to deal with risk management and transformation. I would argue transformation exactly links up to, to these perspectives on limits to, on, and to erosive risk. Risk management comes out of this risk management domain of action and practice that I mentioned before. So there is an expert group. It still needs to be fully implemented and what should, could that expert group deal with and which direction could that dialogue go to? The work I've been doing with colleagues, but also colleagues Boy, James, etc., have been doing, would suggest there is something about this risk lens that, that has salience and relevance for future debate. Let me try to motivate that in the time left to me for this um, webinar. So here the suggestion is, um, to develop a methodological approach that has, a, has principles and, and builds on certain elements that, that research and policy has taken forward. So there's building blocks that this methodological framework can build on. It's, it's a comprehensive risk perspective that's coming out of IPCC. Um, it's building on the issue of risk evaluation, how to define risk tolerance as researchers have taken forward over the years, Kink and Ven. And particularly important is the justice principles, as well, coming up with certain justice principles. For my prior discussion, it was somewhat implicit that it's a lot about justice. So how to make those justice principles more explicit? The debate has been uh, mostly about compensatory justice, so compensating for what has been lost. That's important. You suggest to take that forward under a different heading, maybe called cura curative options. But what's missing in the debate, or what has not been explicitly mentioned so far, is a distribution of justice perspective. How to support, how to take a needs-based approach forward, although it's not being affected. And here exactly this issue of transformation comes in, and I'll try to motivate that later on. As in, so the lesson demonstrated is about places, countries, uh, people, of course, that are facing high-level risks. It is also about the collective action that's what the Paris Agreement. We would argue that also the 
a debate can serve as a canary in the coal mine. So somebody can also signal the urgency of really living up to the song from parking to the ambition. Let me try to work out these three elements in some applications. So the first one is there's this push towards comprehensive risk analytics. It's coming out of IPCC, and you see that one chart that you've seen many times, I guess, before. It is suggestive of, um, right, it, it suggests basically that risk, um, so losses and damages that manifest themselves on the ground, the people and assets um, are a function of um, climate change, but also natural variability. So disasters have been there for centuries, but are being amplified by climate change, as we know, frequency, intensity, and duration. Hazard is a key component of risk, but it's also people's vulnerability. Is, so people's and ecosystems' vulnerabilities. And then see exposure also, people and yeah, other assets that are exposed. Um, that overall manifest themselves as risk. So it's very important. Why is this important? So it points first into the question of risk creation. What is the turning risk? But it also points in the direction what actions to take in terms of reducing risks. Uh, let's look first into the question of like risk creation. And here what we see here very shortly summarize the evidence um, on what determines climate related risk and what What's the, what's the contribution by climate change? So we know intensity, duration, frequencies of quite a few hazards are changing, being changed by anthropogenic climate change. Um, we also know exposure. It's people and their assets are driving the risk and the increases in losses and impacts to some extent. It's also this question about vulnerability. So, so what, what is it? So people living close, living in, in Low-income settlements close to rivers, of course, are more vulnerable than people at higher elevations. So that's also a key driver, and here that's also an area where more research needs to be done. Overall, risk is determined by those factors. Climate change is in there in terms of trends, and it's affecting the hazards. But overall, the exact contribution to risk in a certain location is quite hard to determine. So that's here said as climate attribution being very complex. There has been one paper, somewhat shallow at all in 2016, that tried to tease that out. It's one of the only papers that has achieved that. To some extent, there's also debate about that. So the message would be climate hazards are being sh shifted by climate change, but climate risks, here it's more complicated to really tease out what is what. And that has many implications, not the least for like making the legal case, for example, for compensation. That is quite hard to do. It's not to be forgotten, it's to be taken forward, but somewhat it cannot robustly be done. So what to do, what, what additional action to take. And that's important for that as we go forward for the debate. Um, so that's the risk perspective. And um, IPCC has prominently taken forward um, um, work on risk and tried to summarize its many, many pages of its reports, of its various reports, has developed a risk language that tries to link hazards and climate hazard as a climate-related driver of impacts. It has tried to link that to, um, to, to what determines um, risk overall and what additional actions to take. Here, for example, for the small island states, you see there's a summary chart from the chapter on small island states of the 2014 risk assessment report. Here you see that you see this risk language shortly played out for one one type of risk, and that's high water level events, high tides, linked to sea level rise. And here in that chart, um, you see basically you see a risk, the risk bars shaping out over time. So the full bar is basically the risk levels for a certain time period, like present, near term, or the long term, two degree and four degree. Um, the, the shaded part of the bar is the portion of risk that according to this expert-based assessment can be reduced. So that would mean for today, risk is at medium levels for small island states, Caribbean, Pacific islands, but there's also some European small islands in there, so it's a massive exercise, quite a heroic exercise, of course. So part of this risk could be reduced. It's also suggested here. And then we see over time, risk would shift out and would become quite, it would somewhat hit the ceiling at the right hand side over time. I'm suggesting then risk become, yeah, um, become very high level and of course difficult to deal with. 
So that's the risk language that was developed in 2014. It was like quite a heroic but exciting exercise. Um, and now how to build on that. And, and I think this is a great this is a great effort, a great basis to build on, but it should be taken forward. Also, as it's this kind of work, you will see it again, unavoidable avoided and unavoided impacts into that. Why yeah, it should be built on because this has been done for regions around the world in the IPCC assessment. So it's a great basis to build on and risk science has gone forward and has taken more actions over time. So it's a good basis, but something is missing. I think that something is missing is this question what how, how to tolerate. So what's the what's the preference to risk, what's the tolerance to risk? When would we hit the red space, the intolerable risk levels? So not only physically, but also socioeconomically. So when is it not, when can we not afford anymore to live next to a river? When is, when, when if, if impacts become ever more pronounced, um, how can we buffer against the shocks? Would we need to move or what, what actions to do? That's somewhat indicated in this chart here, which is basically showing the intensity of impacts on the X axis and the frequency of impacts on the Y axis. And it suggests there's certain Levels of risk um, that are accepted where no act further action is taken. And there are certain actions where we have tolerable risks, so risks that are important and need to be reduced or financed. Um, and, that's, um, and then there's also this area of intolerable risk, where water levels are rising or the frequency of, of flooding has become um, yeah, excessive, so that risk is, con risk is considered intolerable. So that's very nice. So that's uh, that's a visualization. The question is, of course, how can this be linked to what I've shown before? And I'll come to that in a second. Before doing that, let me shortly talk about the climate justice perspective, which is implicit, but the big elephant in the room for this has not damage today. So there's, there's a compensatory justice discussion. It's about the political place principle, the um, yeah, the unequal distribution of historical and current emissions. That's, of course, a lot of key, as we discussed many times. So that's to be reckoned with and considered. What has not been looked at as much or not as explicitly stated is the distributive justice perspective. So that's this um, supporting countries on a needs based perspective, irrespective of the emissions of the, the polluter place, of, of the polluter principle and the, uh, the the emissions that were caused and that have led, of course, to warming and all the impacts we mentioned before. So it does not, this perspective does not require directly climate attribution. It can build on efforts that have been taken forward by the disaster risk reduction um, policy domain, for example, under the global facility for disaster risk reduction. So suggestion is here for the further discussion that those principles and just this justice principles can be aligned or should be aligned to lead a way forward. As we are suggesting, basically, this way forward could be to identify a policy option space that is that's distinct from adaptation, from mitigation, but also from disaster risk management. That's composed of two types of actions. The one is the curative options. Of course, curative is just to mean compensatory type of options. Here the idea would be to support increasing costs attributable to climate change, where coastal defenses need to be raised in the face of climate change. There's, yeah, there's national support mechanisms need to be set up, national level mechanisms need to be developed and are being developed in Bangladesh, etc. So also many risks are non-monetary and immaterial. It's also about um, other issues also about legal protection for people that are being pushed to migrate, so forced migration to be supported. Um, for example, under under discussions of this NANS initiative that fo focuses on cross border displacement, and let's also talk about displacement, displacement coordination facility. So here this is this compensatory justice perspective to the option space needs attention and should be pursued. That's rather clear, and, um, but needs to be motivated for that. But we additionally would suggest um, it's also about the option space is also composed of transformative action for risk management. The debate has been largely here on insurance, supporting um, people with um, um, insurance safety nets for the losses and damages that they experience, but there's big discussions also about 
a likelihood transformation, for example, going from from the from agriculture supporting people as they move from agriculture to the service sector or productive sectors, as they do this anyway, can these transformative actions not be supported? Migration is also voluntary migration on some island states or across Europe. Can voluntary migration also be, also be supported if it makes sense and if people want it, of course. It's not about the forced migration part, but the voluntary part. Yeah. And then it's also about linking up to the SDG debate, which is very high level, but it's also seeing attention in terms of like how do we build resilience over time across many across these 18 development goals that are specified in the SDGs. So that's this other part of the space. Overall, here's a busy chart. We're suggesting that these measures can be aligned with these definitions that I've mentioned before. The transformative measures will focus on the avoidable part of the damages and losses. The curative measures, mostly about the unavoided, what's not being done due to trade-offs, and the unavoidable, what's not being done to, due to technical constraints. So that's basically a little bit our policy pro proposal that I want to shortly explain in a second. Here's a broad overview how we see those two perspectives as coming together on top of that. Um, yeah. So that's the policy proposal. My question is, of course, how can we fill this with life and also process? Um, let me just go into that for another five minutes. I hope I have this time. Suggestion is that we build on a, on a this, this is about action at country level or local or regional level. So we can build on the risk on risk governance or risk management approaches that are being used to think about actions on standard risk management. So that can be called risk management or risk governance. It, usually this cyclic, it is cyclic um, efforts follow a certain logic. They go from assessment to methodology to quantification to identifying tolerance to identifying options. Here we have six steps. Um, Another question, of course, what are these options? Mostly these options usually are incremental adjustments. So building the dike or the flat walls a bit higher, um, yeah, building preparedness if, if the event happens and things like that. So that's all good and fine. Um, at one stage, there's also need to think about fundamental adjustments. Um, so that's to say, well, sometimes the dike doesn't make sense to build a bike higher, it may just break. So why not give space to water? Why not open it up and really think about fundamental adjustments? Not do what has been done better, but just do it differently. So that could be called, called fundamental adjustments. And then there's also the issue about transformative adjustments. And um, so that's the interesting part we are suggesting here. So that could mean um, to think about doing something very different. Uh, it could mean voluntary migration, it could also be Enforced migration in the, in the bad sense. So it could mean if you're next to a river, you know, well, if you're, for example, if you're a farmer um, and drought and heat is coming in in a pronounced fashion, um, what is, is it? Does it make sense? Does it still make sense to stay a farmer? But would it make sense to do something different? And that's driven by climate change, but that's also driven by social economic factors. So as we all know. Um, so many farmers may want to do something else or send the kids to the cities to become something else. So there are some underlying processes and climate change is amplifying those. And we would say, well, here it's about transformation that is also linked to the SUD debate. Can this not be part of action on climate change? So this chart was to just to say there's a cycle that can be taken at different levels and it's about not only about incremental actions or fundamental actions, also about transformative actions. And the curative actions are also important, so compensating for what has been lost. That is not to be forgotten, of course. Hmm. That's all theoretical and nice. I mean, not so nice, let me just try to simplify this a little bit uh, for the case of small island states. Um, here we are building on work that had, IPCC had, been, had done, and again, this is this one chart that's showing this risk language as applied to small island states and the issue of high tides amplified by sea level rise. What we try to do, a colleague Tomashenko and myself, we try just to translate the RPCC findings using additional literature. We try to translate this into this question of risk tolerance and the risk and, and option space. And that's what we came up with, building on 
other literature that we also used. The first came up with this color shading here from acceptable, tolerable to intolerable, and then tried to define actions a bit better that can be taken. So it's about the risk space and the option space. What we have seen, um, there has been, of course, a baseline risk. For small island states, let's say Pacific Islands, flooding or high tides have always been there. It has always been an issue. It has been amplified by climate change. We have had more than 20 centimeters of sea level rise globally. That's, of course, affecting the high tides, rather clear. So here's this issue about peer rate actions. It's clear that the climate change types need to be built higher. Can this not be supported by some global climate funding? But then there's this other part of risk uh, of, the, of the space, and that's showed in the shaded box. That's to, to suggest we have risks that go to the upper part of this box. Risks are beyond tolerable, but not, maybe not fully in the intolerable space. And that's, of course, due to debate about where risks are exactly at. Um, the suggestion is risks are there, but they can be reduced. They can be reduced by standard disaster risk reduction of climate change adaptation actions. So that's DRR and climate adaptation actions, but also by this transformative element here. Uh, do something differently from what has been done here. So translate that into that language, and here we found certain options that are being discussed and being taken. So the baseline risk is not seeing additional action, but for standard DRR or climate change adaptation, sea walls are being built. It's about really one. It's about insurance. It's about coastal restoration, building codes, and stuff like that. We would argue <coughs> the transformative part um, and the the transformative part also is seeing action that's on this chart here. It's actually voluntary resettlement or providing alternative livelihoods. So farmers that are not in a position to do farming anymore, what else can you offer those in terms of them making a living? That's the question here. That also we saw being raised in publications and all being relevant for this discussion. So that's what we're suggesting here. This 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 um, the space opens up for loss and damage for transformative action and curative action. So the suggestion is um, global community can should think about how to support this with funding, but also with local level action and support. And to some extent, it's happening already. Let me talk about that later. And that's, so there's a distinct action space, option space for loss and damage, but it's linked to the option space for disaster risk reduction climate adaptation that is seeing attention anyway. And then you can escalate this language out, also looking to the evidence that we have. So over time, there's no action. So in the long term for 40 degrees of warming, of course, there's no action on standard disaster risk and education possible if the water, the water levels are just rising exceedingly. Hmm. So something else that needs attention that's trans transformative action and the involuntary migration as well. So that's this high level language that we put on the RPCC high level language. The question is, of course, how can you make it local? How can you make it take it forward in a tight fashion? We were currently doing that with Indian partners in India. So it's about the local level risk and option space in Tamil Nadu. Work is underway, so it's not finished. I'm quoting on that, hopefully. We're quoting on that, but it's not finished here. Yeah. Colleagues. So again, we are not doing the field work, but it's colleagues have worked in Tamil Nadu in certain villages and surveys with farmers and um, also affected. And also here we develop this this language and try to put options behind that and try to think about what risks mean. Maybe we come up with that part here. So we define incremental, fundamental, and transformative actions. So it's a bit different from what I've shown before, but it's to suggest as well that this language can be taken forward. Incremental action can happen in terms of like also building sea dikes for so protection against flooding. There's fundamental adjustments that are being taken. So salt-tolerant, salt high-yielding varieties of seeds are being implemented. There's unfortunately also this transformative part of it. Yeah, so here it's farmers keep land uncultivated. So we would argue that's already now a transformative action that is, has been mentioned and that's has been had, had to be done um, as yeah, flooding and salinization made farming and un un unproductive in those areas. So again, that's a way to operationalize this for this local level application. It's still underway, but we're presenting some of this uh, COP and uh, also then to think about what actions to take. 
Um, yeah, these are two cases uh, that are building on global evidence and local evidence. Then there's also model-based analysis that can take forward, which we have been doing at YASA, building on our construct simulation model, which is to basically a way to operationalize this risk language, so vulnerability, hazards, exposure, quantifying what risks are in terms of like the loss distribution, but then also thinking about risk evaluation, what's the fiscal tolerance, so this is about nation states and their ability to recover from big events. It's about fiscal resilience, and um, so it's a way to operationalize this risk question here for nation states and their ability to deal with high-level events. Um, I'll jump over this, I think, in the interest of time. But here the question is basically, given that it is a global perspective on disaster risk can be taken and quantified, as you see here, as done by the Global Assessment on Disaster Risk Reduction, they see the average annual losses for countries related to a number of climate-related but also geophysical events. So what, how to deal with these losses? What's the tolerance? And here again, the fiscal tolerance of nation states, the finance perspective, um, how to recover from these big events. And that's basically what we have tried to do with that modeling, trying to ask this question, okay, for a 100-year event, the 100-year event happens, an event that has recurrency of once in, one in 100 years, or 1% chance of um, happening per year. So what, what's, what's the ability, what's the fiscal tolerance to recover from these somewhat high-level events that happen all, all, all the time, as we know. They're always in the media. And here you see what's shaded in red, what's marked in red, shows some countries are having a hard time recovering and would be rather, would rather be in the fiscally intolerant space. So also here, it's a different, totally different way from operationalizing, what I've shown before, but it's also like the issue that has been relevant and interesting. We've done that globally, but we've also done it locally for Bangladesh, and you see the red space for today for Bangladesh for flooding, river and flooding, for 220 and for 250, from one to 100 year events. And the red part is that part that is the or that is somewhat cannot be tolerated or it's hard to pick up for Bangladesh. Bangladesh is one of the front runners in terms of action and risk management, but they also are, of course, one of the most vulnerable countries. So questions, of course, what additional need to do, how to use that, how to reduce those risks and losses over time. Um, so this is basically what I wanted to show on this operationalizing this high level of principles and ideas, which you see are still in the making and which we still need, want to and will tease out in the future. Why? Um, because we think broad risk management is tried to, as I try to motivate here, the risk management, or also call it risk governance, is useful and can serve as a boundary device for aligning this really heavily contested um, uh, perspectives on the loss and damage debate. So there's a way also to align this compensatory and distributive justice consideration that may help to go for a step change beyond the largely symbolic action that we have seen until uh, until now. So over the last four or five years, we've seen largely symbolic action. I would argue. Well, this language or this this framework that we have developed and are testing out as we talk can be linked to this emergent and very, very high-level SDG debate in terms of linking up to the transformation dialogue and discourse. It is also like, um, our friend also helps as an entry point for compensatory justice aspects beyond the simple suggestion, we are losing our lands and give us money, but it's the question, we're losing our lands, give us money, but we have a certain purpose that we can use it for to qualify this a bit. And of course, also this framework and operationalizations may serve as canary in the coal mine to avoid dangerous interference with the climate system. That's quite often forgotten if you talk about the 1.5 and 2 degrees in very abstract terms. That's basically it. Last two slides. <clears throat> Is there anything happening? And what's happening about COP23 that may be on your mind? So on Monday, Fiji, Fiji, the host, uh, the president of the COP23, that will happen in Bonn for logistical reasons, hosted its pre-COP meeting. I think it's still happening. Ministers and high-level negotiators are meeting. One action element, one element on their agenda has been actually the loss and damage issue. So it's being debated. It remains contested. But it's good to do it in Fiji. It's also like we have seen Fiji is also, it has the presidency, but it's of course also one of those places that has been affected. And just last year, 
Fiji was affected heavily by Cyclone Winston, which is considered the the, the, the strongest um, cyclone, tropical cyclone ever in the southern hemisphere. It killed many people, it displaced many people. So Fiji, Fiji government and Fiji negotiators and the population know really what's at stake, and um, so that some action needs to be taken. So saying that, um, COP may see further, we'll see further discussions if may see further action on less damage. We are trying to push it forward with our loss and damage research network. We are trying to push forward thinking and um, debate on that as it needs more input from scientists but also from NGOs that are also part of this network. One thing, one mechanism to doing so is our book that will come out very soon. And yeah, here's some recent publications. And yeah, thanks for the attention. I went a bit over time, but I hope that's acceptable and look forward to any questions you may have. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Rainer. Thank you so much for uh, uh, this presentation. Uh, before starting the Q&A session, let me remind all the participants that your presentation will has been recorded and will be available on our YouTube uh, channel. And also, you're going to share uh, the slides with us, and we're going to upload them uh, on our ICCG website. Um, now, OK. Let's go on with the question for you, Reinhard. And, and let me start uh, by one which uh, refers to the framework we, you were showing uh, and which combines curative and transformative uh, measures to address loss and damage. And the first question is, uh, do you think that referring to curative measures instead of compensatory measures will make it more acceptable? and feasible at the international negotiation level? And what do you actually mean when you talk, by compens uh, talk about compensation? Yeah, thanks Thanks for the question. Of course, at the high level, it's one way of being replaced by another. Um, and that's, that's fair to some extent, because yeah, there are certain red lines in the debate. So talking about curative is... Um, it's, it's maybe helping to replace one for the other, so that's useful. But there's a bit more to that, so I think the curative suggestion would really mean things also taking care more broadly of what makes sense. And I would argue compensation is important um, by itself, but it has this passive notion to it, right? giving money for something that has been lost, and that's may, that may be fair. But um, I think it's also even more useful if supporting, if, if Finance can be used to support action on the ground for something that's useful anyway, which people want to take forward. For example, from changing, for them like like transforming their livelihoods maybe from agriculture to services or productive elements. So that's what's behind this. Not only the name change, but there's also a broader notion of like like um, um, yeah, also transformation involved in that, that, that terminology. So that's to that one, and then maybe can you repeat your second question? So I yeah, just went forward. Um, the second part of that question. No, no, but it, it was basically related to what you have already said. Okay. It wasn't just a specification. And linking uh, with what you were saying about finance, we have a question on insurance. And how do you see uh, insurance as a financial financial instrument being part of climate change adaptation? And what are your thoughts on future developments in this direction? Hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I've, I've worked in the last 50 year, 15 years. So insurance, uh, like, like this, uh, I have worked on disaster risk management in countries, so places where there have not been insurance. So 15 years back, that was totally also contested. Many countries, communities, NGOs are pushing back. Now it's somewhat accepted, and it has found its place in disaster risk management in those places as well. The place is not massive, to be honest, because um, it, it has a useful place, but it needs to be supported from the outside with subsidies, with knowledge and stuff. People, communities, countries are willing to chip in, but there's a key question about affordability here that remains. <clears throat> So it has, has been contested, it has found its place. Now it has been accepted the same debate we're now leading in climate change. And also here it has somewhat found its place. Um, but it also remains a bit the question, okay, how big is that place? And I would also say it's maybe not very massive, 
unless certain further actions are taken. One is subsidies. You need subsidies in terms of funding, but also protecting the people. But then I think also insurance, insurance ideas, insurance support, and insurance actions need to be linked to risk reduction. So into this comprehensive perspective on reducing risk, if it's only replacing or refinancing what has been lost, it's not enough. It, insurance needs to be linked to avoiding future risk creation. So as we go forward, um, future risks need to be created, uh, re need to be reduced, and not old risks need to be replaced or just reinstated. And that's, of course, missing. So insurance is not the great tool to do that, mostly. Standard insurance, which we have in Italy or Germany, doesn't do that. We know that, because the premium you pay is just too low, right? It's, there's no big incentive effect. It's not the adverse, the adverse effect called moral hazard. If you have insurance, you just keep on doing what you're doing. You're living up to a river, to the sea, whatever. Um, so it doesn't really provide these big incentives. It only does so. Align it directly with actions by institutions, by disaster risk management actors. So that's how it can be aligned um, in Italy or Germany. But it can also be done so in Africa. For example, so in Africa, we have, a, we have a regional insurance system against credits um, and, and losses that um, farmers are facing in quite a few areas in Eastern, in Eastern Africa. And here, this is a compensation insurance pool that helps with like providing finance after the fact. But the finance after the fact is, is related to necessary action before something happens, namely to um, like preparedness plans that national actors but also NGOs need to take in those places. So they are prepared once the event happens. So these plans, these contingency plans have to be set up before the event happens, then the finance scheme, the insurance scheme comes together and thus pooling across a number of nation states, then countries get a Pay out, but they also like have a way to deal with that after the event happens or during the event happens. So I think that's a great example. It still needs more attention, but I think that's where the insurance debate should go to under the climate heading, of course, and also under this question is who should the global community support this for adaptation, but also for loss and damage. It's a long, 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 long answer to a short question, but of course, insurance remains a big topic. Okay, thank you, Rainer. And the next question actually refers to um, a graph uh, by Boyd et al., the one published in Nature Climate Change, and if you could maybe give your interpretation on that, because it was noted that, uh, you know, where they depict uh, the different uh, conceptualization, let's say, on what is loss and damage, um, the adaptation and mitigation perspective, which is the one by basically developing ca developed countries, negotiators, has no intersection with the conceptualization by LDCs or by small island developing states. So how does this incompatibility in conceptualizing loss and damage translate at the negotiation level? And what are the consequences? The consequences uh, in defining actual solution for loss and damage? Hmm. Yeah, exactly. That's a good question. Um, I guess this broad, this, this like, this visualization of perspectives that were voiced during these 37 or so, 38 or 37 expert interviews, and Boyd et al. So I was also one of those, to be honest. Um, um, that was interviewed. Um, so Boyd et al. tried to then put it, saying there is certain boxes where certain yeah, where, for example, parties to the convention, like developed countries or developing countries, would end up in. So, like, um, on the upper part, it's all the small island states in the LDCs. In the lower end, where it says it's nothing special about loss and damage, it's not the developed countries. So, they try to put this into boxes and saying that's what we find, and that's something interesting, and that's, of course, countries or negotiators, for example, defending their interests, negotiating about their interests. So that was the one thing in their paper. Uh, but the other ele element, and that's somewhat shown here, and I'm not sure it can be perfectly shown, but the other um, element that's shown here with these colors and these circles is basically, they were saying there is no polarization, actually. 
we get people, they stay in their boxes. They are not willing to endlessly break out of these boxes, but they're somewhat willing. And there's no easy polarization happening. So that was basically what they're suggesting here, this adaptation mitigation perspective that says nothing different, nothing distinct about an image. Even they were saying, well, maybe there is this risk element for it here. Uh, so there's a bit of overlap, overlap here. And this risk management element is linked somewhat to limits to adaptation. So somewhat there seems to be willingness to go across this polarization. That was what, what they were saying tentatively in the Nature Climate Change paper. And maybe I can just self-promote myself. I have my little views and views. Um, what is it now? Views and perspective in nature climate change, commenting on that paper. I was also interpreting Boyd and Al's finding as saying, well, actually, yeah, people are in boxes, but the boxes are not endlessly clearly defined. So saying that, you could draw the circles maybe in different fashions. And the, the discourse is not, is not really, it's, it's not ending in this corner in the corners only, but there's a way to cut across the discourse. And I would say the risk management thing is exactly that one, this space or this discussion space that can cut across it. Of course, I also, also said in one of my slides, there's this expert group that's being set up on risk management, but also on transformation. And transformation, of course, has also implications for this existential circle that we see in the upper, on the upper right-hand side. So my interpretation of Freud is saying, well, it's boxes, but the boxes don't take it to the floor. You can overcome those. So that's, of course, a positive spin on it. But I think we have to be positive on it. And in, on it, and, and I think there's some reason for being positive about it. Yeah, again, a longer yep, yep. Line. OK, OK, thank you. Hmm. Um, let me just check, because we have uh, one other question that has just arrived. And um, I'm trying to <laughs> to go through it very quickly. Um, OK, but I will go back to it in a second. Actually, let me remind you that we have only a couple of minutes. So these are the very last uh, and quick uh, <laughs> question I will pose to you. And so I hope you can also reply in a pretty short fashion. So um, the first one. Uh, is about the way um, you conceptualize loss and damage recurring to the concept of acceptable, tolerable, and intolerable risk. And the meaning that these terms uh, have, of course, vary considering different nations, different communities. So how can uh, these very context-specific uh, uh, considerations on what tolerable and intolerable is um, be taken into account at, in climate change negotiations and actually uh, inform the definition of actions uh, to address loss and damage in a mechanism, uh, for example, like the, the Warsaw International Mechanism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, that's also like a longer question. I could give a longer answer. I, I think that's exactly, the research plays a key role for addressing or informing that big question that you're raising. Yeah, exactly. Risk tolerance on the surface looks rather clear and important. And I think there's, there has been good debate about that in the risk field that this is important. But this debate has been going on for 20 to 30 years. And it's not so clear what the methods and tools are to optimize that. So service can help, uh, as I've shown for Tommy and Arthur, to ask people, how do you see it? You can uh, set up expert groups, focus groups. We get different perspectives on it, on monetary and non-monetary losses and damages. So that's fairly valid and great, and that needs to be taken forward. So not one answer to this one question. But then you can also take it forward to this question about nation states and their fiscal perspective. And here you can put a number behind it. And that also looks rather clear and solid on the surface. But as we have found over the years, where we have been interacting with countries that are vulnerable, including Bangladesh, so it's also once you touch down, touch base with those decision makers. And there's only a few of those that would negotiate or would make decisions on that. Even then, it becomes quite complicated. So, so this is to say that uncertainty here, of course, in framing the narratives and, and providing a broad perspective on this somewhat simple, maybe it's simple equation, but a very com complex answer really needs attention. I think it's a great field for research, and that's really what we are looking into, trying to make this more concrete. But there will not be one answer, of course. There have to be 
multiple answers um, that need to be put into perspective. Okay, so I would say that with these considerations, we we could close the webinar because actually I I don't want to run out of time. And so I really really want to thank you so much, Rainer. Let me just show my face so I can do it virtually at least. <laughs> thank you again for being with us today. Thank you to all the participants. Thank you for the questions you sent. And sorry if uh, for time consideration I was not really able to manage all of them. But of course, feel free to touch and base with us and we'll be happy to, to continue with this uh, uh, discussion. And again, I invite you to uh, follow our activities uh, at ICCG. We're going to have uh, another webinar. We're still uh, defining the speaker, but it will be exciting as usual. Uh, so please uh, uh, follow our updates. And OK, I will uh, conclude by thanking again Rainer and, and thanking you all for being with us. And I really hope to virtually meet you again at the next uh, seminar. Thank you again, and have a nice afternoon. Thanks, also. Thanks.